Welcome to EdTech Speaks, a podcast bringing guests together to share their expertise and advice on navigating business and education in a technology-driven world. From entrepreneurs to vendors, higher education to corporate leaders, we'll uncover their perspective regarding the latest trends and technologies impacting your career or business. Our podcast is made possible by Downing EdTech Consulting, where people and technology connect. Hosted by Cher Downing, an experienced executive spanning a higher education and corporate career with specific focus on the EdTech industry, Dr. Downing is also an international and national presenter, author, and regular media contributor. Now here is your host, EdTech strategist, Dr. Cher Downing. Hi, everyone. Welcome to EdTech Speaks, a podcast where we bring guests to share their expertise and advice on navigating business and education in a technology-driven world. Our goal is to provide you with the options for products, services, and knowledge that can help benefit you or your business. I'm Cher Downing, your host, and I want to introduce today's guest, Justin Walski. Hi, Justin. Hey, I'm Justin Walski. I run Caseworks out of Long Beach, California, and it's great to be with you today. Wonderful. We're so excited to have you here because you guys at your company do a lot of really innovative things that are even more important in uh, the COVID pandemic. So if you would share with our audience a little bit about Caseworks and what they do, and then we'll talk a little bit about the impact to the industry. Sure. Well, first I would say, Cher, you were one of the first people that we talked to when, when the idea was really a germ in our minds and just a few scribbles on some paper. We came and visited some faculty at Arizona State University. This was probably seven or eight years ago. You were one of the first people that saw it and was a real beacon of validation for us because we didn't have much at that time, but your insights helped us understand that we were sort of on the right track, at least in those early days. So what we do at Caseworks is we sort of run by the motto of um, better decisions through story. So we take the case method of learning, which is story-driven, problem-driven, and decision-driven, and we take it off the page. It's traditionally a uh, paper style stories that you'd see in a business school or a medical school. And we turn them into audiovisual stories, really movies that you would experience. And then you make decisions. in. And we do all this because we want to give people an immersive experience of living inside a problem and building skills that are very hard to build in traditional education. Things like situational awareness, emotional intelligence, strategic decision making. All these things are really hard to train for in traditional classroom settings, but it's also very hard to provide a scalable experience where you can consult with a patient who has a health problem or negotiate the severance package for a long-term employee. All these things are very emotionally wrought. They're complicated. You don't get a lot of chance to train them. So we use Caseworks as an engine where you can do things like that. Well, I can tell the audience it's fantastic for a couple of reasons. One is... I think we all learn when we have choices to make in a situation, and there's always an afterthought. I should have picked the other answer. I should have handled things differently. This gives you that opportunity to experience that scenario and not really feel like you chose the wrong answer, but that there's a better answer. There's a better solution to the problem. And I think that is so validating when we live in a world where everything is right or wrong, black or white, and we always get you know, really self-imposed when we pick the wrong answer or we feel like we are going to look like we're uninformed or, or lack of knowledge. So it's exciting to see those types of tools. I think one of the things that I always found interesting about it was the fact that it adds dimension and depth to the topic that you're talking about. And for those of you in the audience that have ever worked on a case study or been assigned to read a case study, they're pretty flat, one-dimensional, dry, And it's really hard to visualize. One example I think of is Medium right now puts out a lot of cold case stories. And so when you read a cold case story, obviously you read about the murder that occurred and you read about the details that occurred, but you find that most people will tell you what they really go to is the pictures that are included because the pictures give you that three-dimensional feel that reading that level of detail just doesn't give you. So I think it's something that we definitely need more of in higher ed. I think we need more of it also in corporate learning and in a variety of ways where people can really expand on that. 
one of the things that, that you talked about was really getting in specifically to medical schools and into business schools, because obviously those are two very areas that are, are really varied in what they do. Are you looking in the future at other types of schools? I'm thinking in terms of either like law schools or thinking in terms of HR departments that have, particularly now with issues with diversity and culture and those types of areas and looking at expanding out? Yeah, so we are, we're actually in some of those programs, HR, organizational development, all the way from the higher ed to, to workplace pipeline. Some of the curricula that we built in the past two years has been around subjects of organizational development and human resources. We just finished a large curriculum on managing difficult conversations in the workplace. Before I started research on this subject, I went around to a number of HR leaders at very, very big companies and small companies and everything in between. And I would ask them, what are the biggest organizational problems that you have as a company? And time and time again, to my surprise, difficult conversations was something that just came up almost every single time. But people cannot have them in the workplace. Older generations tend to be either too aggressive or passive aggressive, and younger generations tend to avoid them completely. So you just have these festering conflicts that really affect an organization's performance. So we started diving into things like that. We also built a curriculum with the Cal State University system on implicit bias and faculty hiring, which is Mm -hmm. one of the big challenges for schools that are trying to increase the diversity of their teaching ranks. So we've been diving into these subjects over the past two years, and it's been a gateway to other parts of a university, but it's also been a gateway into a workplace, which is um, where a lot of our growth has been recently. It is so true. I know in the higher ed realm, for years, there's always been discussion over increasing diversity in the faculty. But nine times out of 10, a faculty member applies because someone there reached out to them. Or a dean will reach out to another institution and say, let's have a visiting professor. And that visiting professor eventually works into a full-time professor staying at that institution. When you're in a tenure track, you're typically pulled from major. And so they're looking at, we need someone in a tenure track in a specific major, not necessarily because of who you are or what you're bringing in value outside of your knowledge base. So it's exciting to hear that you're working on some of those things. One of the other things I thought of while you were talking about that is Are you seeing more interest in doing things in terms of across the board, looking at demographics and transition as many of these companies, you know, we have a large set of the baby boomers who are now retiring. Companies are downsizing a little bit with COVID. And so that's increasing the amount of retirees. Are you seeing some cultural changes that that have opportunities for training and transition as well? Well, learning professionals in the workplace, as I'm sure you know, are kind of straddling these almost oppositional cultures where your boomer cultures are much more direct, they're much more hierarchical, and the the millennial or younger groups are much more diffuse. They're mobile first, they're native internet, but their their interactions, as I mentioned before, there's not a lot of direct confrontation and there's not a lot of communication that we might experience for those of us who are are a little bit older. So there's a big challenge for learning professionals on how do you create uh, learning tools that will effectively reach both of those groups? It's a debate that rages on, of course. We address it by story. The reason that we're so captivated by story, one is that that's my profession. I am a film producer by trade. That's what I teach at Cal State LA. So I, I come from that background. But The reason we rely on story is because it's cross-generational. Storytelling is the oldest form of teaching that we have. It's the most effective, and it's how our brain actually works. We remember things through context, which is story is kind of the way we codify experience and the way we kind of encase it in amber or, or sap. And that's why we continue to go back to it. But if you're not using a modality like storytelling, it's incredibly challenging to bridge a 57-year-old programmer against a 23-year-old young woman working in HR. Just very difficult to reach them both at the same tool. I think it is something that as we transition in the ages, if we transition in the cultures, we're also getting that, that almost double whammy of now we're, we're trying to be more culturally sensitive and we're bringing in more people, but they also handle problems differently because they've come from a different culture. 
but storytelling is storytelling. It's uh, so interesting right now in COVID. It doesn't matter where you're at. You are feeling senses of anxiousness and senses of sadness and concern and wondering when's this going to end or how it's going to end. And, and it doesn't matter who you are or where you're sitting. And so I think you're absolutely right. It is something that resonates with us. All of us remember things based on the story around it, not necessarily the date or you know some other action. That's why it becomes so inherent to us. So talk to us a little bit about, because I, I love your process, but I'd love the audience to know, particularly because with your film background, you just have such a different perspective when you approach these projects than what I would say is the typical person, even like myself, an instructional design focus who says, okay, there's content. Where do we move the content? How do we push the content forward? Do we meet all of these criteria? But as a filmmaker, you have a double lens because you're also looking at, at the quality, the richness of the story, the characters, all those things that encompass watching a great movie or why we love certain commercials over others. Talk to us about the process that you go through when you get a project and how you kind of take that from the beginning up to then when it gets into the technology portion. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the big pet peeves that I have for educators is educators are often pushed into being great storytellers or let's just use story. And it's a really challenging craft. The way I talk to it with my grad students, I teach mostly grad grad film producers. Storytelling is a craft, just like many other crafts we have. I always start my class by telling them, if I told you guys that you had to make a chair, a wooden chair, all of you could do it. They would be really bad chairs. They wouldn't be comfortable to sit in. They would probably fall apart as soon as you sat on them. They wouldn't be comfortable. Your back would be sore. The legs would be uneven. But it would functionally be a chair. This is often what we ask our educators to do with modalities like story, where they have a familiarity with it because they've experienced it. But They've not spent any time in the seat developing the craft. It's really not fair. So the way that we approach it is a story first lens in that we try to find problems. You know, we usually go to an organization and we we ask them what their major problems are. Uh, It could be difficult conversations. It could be cultural or diversity inclusion issues. It could be sales. But all of those things have problems. And that's where you start. You start with the problems because problems become conflicts and conflicts are the engine of your story. Any story that is worth listening to has a conflict. In it. Otherwise, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> didn't have a problem. Things went great. Why would I want to hear that story? Even so, Disney stories have a problem. Even Disney, they, they have the most, <laughs> they have the most iconic and mythical problems, all of them. <laughs> There's only about 10 stories in the world anyway. So you just keep moving between them. So we really try to hunt for the most compelling angle to that problem. And through that problem, we can then build our characters And really then it starts to unfold. So it's problem first, then characters, and then you start understanding what the story is. Like you said, with most instructional designers, you are coming from your modalities and your teaching technology and your learning requirements. We try to free ourselves from that in the beginning. Of course, we have to lay that on later, but it's really important to make sure we have a compelling base to start from that the story is as potent as it can be. And then we start figuring out how can we bring in our learning objectives? What are the things they have to understand? What are the things are tested? But that is a second level process. So tell me when you're working with someone who is really not story visionary, because we see this in instructional design. We know the course needs to be moved. We know there are ways to enhance it and do great things with it. The individual looking at it sees it in one dimension and sees it in one, only one possible way to do it. How do you work with people when you can start to see the story roll out and they're just not seeing that vision? Yeah, I'll be honest. This was one of the the areas of naivete that I had when I started Caseworks, which was I thought I would do it a few times. I would show this, this pedagogy and modality and would demonstrate how to do it. And then others would pick up the torch. And that really was not the case. And I was, I was pretty naive about that when I started. But the way that we address that, the thing that makes uh, storytelling so powerful is it an emotion-first exercise. It's a, there's one of my uh, old film professors uh, used to say, we're in the business of emotional transportation. Nobody ever goes mm. to a movie, pays $12, and then leaves and goes, I felt the exact same way that I felt when I came in. That was amazing. You are in the business of emotional transportation. So 
a lot of our work is done if we are able to emotionally transport them to some approximate place of what's going on in the story. So we get a lot less pushback when the story is effective. If the story is not effective, that's when you start getting the objections <laughs> about the, the learning objectives weren't great, or I'm worried about this, this, and this. If people, if you meant them to be angry and they were angry, if you meant them to be sad, they were sad, so on and so forth, you get a lot less objections on the other side. So my job is to take the problems that they've been grappling with, those large organizational problems, those teaching problems, build a compelling narrative. And if I'm able to do that, it becomes very easy on the other side. The vision is seen. Whereas if I don't do that, then we start getting into the weeds. <laughs> it's a little similar in instructional design. You know, if you don't paint the picture well enough, they either one, think you're kind of crazy and off the deep end, or two, it's impossible to do. And I think for all of us, in lots of various ways, that's always the struggle. When we don't know a craft, we are assumptive that everything has to be done in a certain uh, lockstep manner. And so anything that we don't quite understand is always really difficult for us. I do love that term, emotional transportation, because I think that is, is so valid, particularly right now during the pandemic. I mean, I think Netflix clearly has been the emotional transportation since March. They're about the only company in the world that's making the, that kind of money for not having an actual physical product of their own besides Amazon, who obviously just supplies us with everything in the world, but Netflix supplied us with the one thing Amazon can't do, which is that emotional contribution and to take us away, to get us to think about other things and to look at other things. So I see this as this is a really great piece that you're doing right now. And this is really so instrumental in what, what COVID has brought to us and where I don't think we're going to ever go back to a normalcy that we knew before. But where do you see going next? What would you love to see in terms of technology or what you're doing or what the vision of your company is? But as we're now changing and we've brought in a whole host of additional learners who previously sat along the sidelines and said, no, no, we're good. You know, we're face-to-face -face people. Where do you see us going next with all of this? Well, there's a couple answers. Well, you know, the, the first one that jumps to mind is less a technology than a pedagogical shift in thinking. I think we were really deserved throughout the 20th century by the way that we taught insofar as we would say, take your emotions out of this or <laughs> let's look at this from a logical perspective. If you look at all the textbooks from management textbooks to pretty much anything you get your hands on, it was trying to remove one's emotions from management decisions or the decision-making process or whatever it was you were doing, high order functions, which is the exact opposite of how we actually make decisions in the world. Every decision we make is emotional in some way. And then we use yeah. logic or reason as a way to justify why we made the decision. So I hope that even though we have these technological, these space constraints and these distance constraints through COVID, and which may have a very long tail, I do hope we continue committing and doubling down on teaching styles that will understand and be okay with the fact that we are emotional first, that, that our, our decision-making nexus comes from that. And there are ways to manage our emotions and there are ways to optimize them so that you can increase performance. But to act as if they are not there is something we've done for a really long time and it's not very effective. I think it will get worse. It will be exacerbated if we continue those teaching styles with distance learning on top of it, with asynchronous modalities on top of it. So I think we have to lean more into social emotional learning. We have to lean more into building those, people call them soft skills. I hate that term because I it know. makes it feel as if they're secondary because those are the actual valuable skills. Like, you know, I don't, you learn, if you know Excel, great. But if you know <laughs> how to manage a conflict between two people who really don't like each other, you are worth your paycheck. But to build those skills, those are really tough to find centers in our brain, things like having better situational awareness, things like building emotional intelligence. Those are really challenging things to do. And the only way you get there is through more improved social emotional learning techniques. What's well, interesting because a lot of times I work with startups purely on preparation. Everyone has their idea for the greatest widget and they're going to be the next Bill Gates of Mark Zuckerberg. 
but the problem is they don't know how to present themselves. And, you know, I've had people say to me before, well, you know, you, there's a lot of places that have workshops and you can learn how to present to an investor. And I said, no, no, this is more simplistic than that. I said, this is, how do you dress to go to one of these things? Should you be turned and in, in facing the PowerPoint the entire time talking when you're flipping through the slides? Not using slang terms just because you like to use certain verbs all the time that, you know, maybe the people in your audience aren't going to understand. Even just things as simplistic as networking and handshaking and all of those things where we've really just lost a lot of that stuff. And so we have people that have really great ideas, but they get up in front of a, a group and it's just such a poor sales job, not from the sense of the product, but from the sense of themselves. And again, it's emotional. I tell people, I said, watch Shark Tank. When someone has a really good story, one of those people will invest in it. And I said, and if you compare it to another investment, they probably aren't as far along. They may not have as much capital. They may not have as much product. They don't maybe even have as good a business plan. But they struck a chord with somebody who said, I'm willing to take a chance on you because there's a connectivity to the story you just told me. And so I said, you know, that's part of it too, is, is getting your audience to understand why you came up with this widget. What are you doing it for? What's your end result or your hopes and your dreams of it? And they can sometimes forgive that you're standing there in a wrinkly shirt if they feel like they're connected to you. And I'm with you. I despise the term soft skills. Unfortunately, that's kind of what people instantly understand and recognize that they need to do. And I think in teaching, that's another area that it's difficult. We have not over the years really plotted in that emotional piece into teaching. And typically you learn to teach by shadowing someone. And so you pick up their habits. If you get a great teacher, you're usually turn out to be a great teacher. But if you get a really poor teacher, I know people who have in their graduate work followed someone and they're like, well, he shows up to class, he pushes out a bunch of handouts, he turns it over to me to lecture, he sits in the back, or he goes back to his office. Well, if that's all you have to draw on, that's your assumption of how to run your own classroom down the road. When you see that faculty member that's engaged, that's interested, that all of the students converse with them, which is also, by the way, as you know, an easier way to move on to Zoom. So when suddenly we shut the doors tomorrow, I'm already used to talking to you face to face. So it's not a big deal now to start talking to you in another delivery mode. So it is, it's something that we're lacking. And it made me think about it as we were sitting here talking about this. Is that something that would be something you would take on is looking at moving into the education space in terms of secondary and elementary ed and higher ed and doing case scenarios based on better performance as teachers? Yeah, I mean, we've gotten a lot of inbound requests before that over the years, looking at younger cohorts like high school, even down to elementary school, because it's every everyone understands storytelling and scenarios are very easy to grasp and you're really just making decisions. It's about the, the construction of the scenario, how complicated it is. We tend to, uh, one, we haven't done it. And really that's not because of our disinterest in the learning groups. It's because of bandwidth, as you know, K through 12 operates so differently than higher ed, which operates so differently from workplace. So in order to serve those markets competently, you have to have a lot of capacity. We still are a very, very small team. We bulk up when we build scenarios and then we get very, very small again. So a lot of it has just not been having the capacity in order to serve K-12 in the way that you would need to. Our hope, and this is what we started to do over time, we partner with subject matter experts. So again, if you're doing something in difficult conversations, you, you partner with somebody there. If you're doing something in entrepreneurship, you partner with somebody there. Our job is really taking their subject matter expertise and narrativizing. So we are hoping that we will find the right K-12 educators who have a vision of how they can use story-based learning and scenario-based learning in those settings. They, and if we find that person, we can absolutely help them get there but we don't tend to move into spaces without that subject matter expertise anymore. We got a lot of good lessons early on of really lean into what you're good at. You know, you have to, when you're running your own startup, you have to sell, you have to market, you have to do product, you have to do HR and culture. The more mature you get, we said to ourselves, you know, we're not good at this thing and we're not good at this thing. We're good at this thing. So let's double down on that 
and just get the partnership and allyship to do the things that we're not as good at. And K-12 would be one of those areas. Absolutely. But that's a good teaching moment as well for our audience, especially for those that are doing startups. One of the things that you don't realize is you are the entire organization. You know, I filled a survey out recently and it said, list all of your your CFO and your HR person and all of these things that I'm thinking, wonder if they'll notice if I type in my name in the majority of those. Yeah, I have a few people on my team that that handle things, but clearly you're not like a larger organization to say, oh, you know, these are all different people. And for our EdTech startup audience, that's something that you do for quite a while, not just because of cash flow and getting started, but also because you want to do things the right way and you want to set things up and you want to be prepared that you're really putting together a product or a service that's the way you visioned it to be and that you do work out all of those things of what are we good at? What are we not good at? What is lovely to do, but we're not making revenue on it? Or what is lovely to do and nobody's really interested in it? That happens a lot of times where you do something that's really great and everybody says, oh, that's fantastic, but nobody wants to buy it or nobody wants to invest in it. So that's harder to decide on when you've got a big team of people and a lot of voices as opposed to when you're understanding how everything intertwines together. I think that most, gives you better decision making. Most of my days I'm working with founders of some type, so early stage or late stage entrepreneurs. And one of the things that I tell them, it's very hard to, to understand this intuitively without going through it. It is so hard to get a product or service sold. There's somebody to actually buy what it is you're making. And it feels like in your mind, you say, oh, it's pretty hard. What I tell my founders is you have to delight this person, this this customer. (laughs) It doesn't have to be cool. It doesn't have to be, oh, that's really neat. You have to knock their socks off, just flatten them. If you don't do that, you become the worst company to have, which is called a, a nice to have company. And if having a nice have product or service is the most frustrating thing. It's, it's much worse than having something that people hate. Because when, when you have something that people hate, they're just like, I don't like that. And, and it's very clear from the beginning. If you build something that's nice to have, people will string you along forever and they will say, oh, that's great. It's really nice. Yeah, it's cool. I hope, you know, I hope it goes well with that. And it takes you years to find out you built something that has no urgency behind it and that people won't fight for especially in education for, for ed tech entrepreneurs, if you don't have something that either a professor or a teacher or a principal, a superintendent, a janitor, somebody in that community, if they're not going to champion what you're doing and go to bat for you, you're dead in the water. And they're not going to do that unless you delight them, unless you just strike them with lightning. So with your limited resources, you have to pour everything into what you're good at. If it's product development, you have to find somebody else who can help you do the marketing. If it's marketing, you have to find a subject matter expertise to make the product as good as possible. But you have to double down on what you're excellent at because excellent is the only thing that's going to allow you to survive to the next stage. That is so true. And you know, when I sat on the other side of the table, it was always interesting to me. I could tell how a product would come in based on who recommended it. So when you have a dean or a vice president who goes to a conference and sees the latest, greatest widget and comes back and says, this is fantastic. We should use this. We don't even know what it does, but we start making amends to, we should use this. If you have someone who is middle management, who comes back from a conference and says the same exact thing, that's where the stringing starts because below them, you're talking about change. And above them, you're talking about spending money. And so neither the twain shall meet. So the middle (laughs) management just keeps treading the water, hoping that for some reason, someone will suddenly find it appealing. What I always found successful was finding that one faculty, the faculty who gave it their all, maybe was award-winning, students loved them, who had a problem. And if we could find the solution to that problem, that faculty would sing the praises to the other faculty, which would then make that group want to embrace something. And if the faculty were happy, I guarantee you the people above middle management were ecstatic and wanted to secure that happiness. Again, going back to emotional intelligence, what's that feel-good story? My faculty are happy because we bought this widget. 
And so you could suddenly mirror those together when you got that balance just right. But it's a hard balance. And you've got to have a vendor that's willing to keep knocking and keep coming to the door, not just a one-off and then say, oh, well, you're not interested. I'll call you back in six months. I'm like, I may have the perfect opportunity for you in two weeks, but I need you to show up for this. So it's it's different. You have to have those champions. We've had them. You've been one of them for a long time, but we've had you know, a dozen or so faculty or folks in the education ecosystem who just kept banging the drum for us. And we can't, at a certain point, you can't do that. At a certain point, it's marketing or it's biz dev. You can talk about how great you are all the time, but it's still through that that lens of, well, of course they're going to say they're great. They're trying to sell their, their company. But you must have those 10 or 12 champions that are outside your organization that are competent enough to sell up and down the ladder uh, for you inside their ecosystems. If you don't, you just won't get the traction. And then you've got to figure out how to empower them. What are their incentives? Is, is it Do they want to solve a classroom problem? Are they trying to, to make their name in their own scholarship? Once you figure out what those incentives are, you have to do whatever you can as your, your, your startup to help empower them uh, because they are, they are worth your weight in gold. You certainly couldn't afford them at their market rates if you were paying them to be a consultant or an advisor. So you have to do whatever you can to empower them because they are your lifeline. Absolutely. That is valuable advice because I know in our audience, we have people at all varied levels of startup phase. And I think we're going to see more as people are facing job elimination or rifts or layoffs. For many folks, I think they're, they're considering this as an opportunity and they're thinking now's the time to go and try and do something new. And I think it's a good time to do something new. I think the world right now is embracing anything that's new and interesting. But as you said, you've got to really have that pitch together. You've got to really have that focus. And they've got to feel your passion for the project. I think all of us at any level, whether it's sitting in a meeting with a vendor, whether it's going to buy a car, you've seen that person that is hungry and wants to work with you. And you've seen that person that's just like, oh yeah, here, here I am, you know, here's what I do. And there's just not that level of passion. And you just in turn think, well, if you're not passionate about it, why should I be? That's a big encouragement for our audience. You, you really need to think about that. And one of the other things I wanted to ask you about, Justin, is I know you hire a lot of talent because unlike other people who grab people down the hallway to do their videos or maybe you know have their nephew in it or something, you guys actually hire professional talent to do all of these pieces. Talk to us a little bit about what you look for and how you kind of go about managing what are essentially freelancers doing this kind of work. Yeah. So uh, that is the way that we do it. Like I said, my, my background as a film and television producer. So I absolutely treat these projects like they are a film and television project. We, we have all professionals. We do auditions with actors. We have actors do all of the roles. All, they're all script based. And I serve as the director. I, my MFA is from UCLA in film directing. So one of the structural advantages we have is that our small team is able to go and do that sort of as an instinctive act. So the way that we handle it, everybody is an independent contractor, and that's much the way the film and television world works anyway. So one of the advantages of being in Southern California, which is an industry town, is you've got a lot of talent who understands how that works. They, you know, you're going to have a director of photography, you're going to have a sound person, you're going to have a crew, and they know it's a job. And they're a freelancer. You don't have to train them. They're coming together for this short amount of time. Fortunately, the skills of film of content creation are growing exponentially. The YouTube generation and a, and a video first generation has built a cadre of young people who are fairly competent in things like getting good images and getting good sound and working through post production. I would say, if you don't have those skills and you are trying to do more multimedia based learning or content focused education, don't use this as an opportunity to learn on the fly. <laughs> Again. You must delight. And it took me a good four years of making really bad stuff before I learned how to make good stuff. So, <laughs> you know, learn on your own time. You've got to find those persons, find those people. And for if you're trying to build a team yourself and you're, you're not from that background, get a good producer. You know, get a good producer and put the project in her hands and really let her take it to the end zone. But yeah, it's not a good process to try and make all of those infrastructural costs within your company 
right? We don't have three editors who are sitting around. We don't have a crew that is, you know, waiting for the next gig. Content simply doesn't work like that in the 21st century. You know, it did in the 1930s when you'd buy all the stuff and you'd be vertically integrated. You've got to move way too fast these days and use the talent for the time being. And then hopefully when the next project comes along, you can come to them again. One thing I will say about that process is we work with a very small group of people over and over again. I've had the same director of photography for basically every project I've done. I've had 80% of the same crew because they know what I'm trying to accomplish. They know the speed at which I work and you don't have to skill them up and train them up from the beginning. So find a good team, stick with them. I would agree with that. I have a good team as well. And I do all sorts of things to make sure I keep them intact because the same thing, once you figure out who knows how you work, what you need, your preferences and in, in how you do things. And I, for me, I like people that take some initiative. They're not going to come to me for every little question. When they do come to me, they come with me also, with also possible solutions, which is you asked me to do this, you can have A, you can have B, you can have C, but here's the benefits and pitfalls to each one of those. That, as you know, cuts down a lot of time because we've got solutions, we're picking what we're going to do, and we're going to move forward. But also, I think it goes back to the emotional storyline that we've been talking about since we started, which is these are people that get you, that understand you. And when they build a relationship with you, you can laugh about when things don't go right. You can joke about when something you thought was going to turn out great doesn't turn out so great. But then you also start to clamor, how do you fix it? You know, how do you come together and who's got a great idea to do something with this? Um, Nothing gets wasted that way. And everything gets impactful and they feel part of the process and part ownership of the project, which is always a beautiful thing. So there's two things that I always, you know, whether, whether I I guess technically I'm the CEO of this company, I call myself a founder, but you know, I I run a few organizations and one thing I tell Uh, founders who are early on in their process starting their companies, a founder or a chief executive or whatever you want to call him or her, you have two jobs. You have to bring the gasoline and you have to bring the eyeglasses. And the gasoline is the fuel. You got to be able to run out of, you know, don't don't run out of money. Don't run out of the things you need to do what you're trying to do. And you got to bring the vision. Everything else, somebody should be better at it than you are. And as a CEO or a head of a project or head of a company, you are best served by facilitating people who are better at doing what they do than you ever could and just providing them with the vision and the roadmap to get there. Those type of people respect that. Crafts people who, if you're a great instructional designer, if you're a great content creator, if you're a great actor, what you respect as somebody who's a craftsperson is somebody with a vision giving you the roadmap so that you can ply your craft. And that's really what your job becomes, is facilitating the strengths of other people. Just bring those two things and you should be good. That is words of wisdom for our ed tech startup folks and for everyone, actually. If you're out there and you're running a team of any type, and particularly now when you're remote, you've really got to invest some time and some energy into keeping that focus and keeping those goals in sight, but also just keeping track of those people. You know, what's going on in their life? We've all learned to live very, very differently in the last six months. And we've all had our great days and we've all had our days where we've just shut down. I had somebody send a a note out day before yesterday. He's pulling people together for three hours of writing on a Zoom call. And he said, because I sit in my house, I'm not feeling energized. I go out on my porch, I'm not feeling energized. He said, you know, I used to go to a coffee shop and write, but that's not really an option right now. So he said, I think I just need people around me, even though we're not talking. So he's trying to think outside the box. And immediately, 17 people in this group popped up and said, what time do we start? (laughs) Oh, I'm, you know, I'm looking for a reason to write and this will force me to do it. I mean, we're all looking for that emotional connectivity and we're all, all looking for how to make that turn into something better, both personally and professionally. So I think what you said is exactly spot on. I hope that our audience take those words to heart. Justin, what is your website that they can take a look at? And we'll also have it on the podcast page, but let them know your website so they can check out some of the interesting things that you're doing. Sure. You can go to Caseworks at www.caseworks.co and that's 
C-A-S-E-W-O-R-X dot C-O. So caseworks.co. I'd also let folks know who are on the entrepreneurship side. My co-founder, one of the larger tech accelerators in Los Angeles. So if you are in the Southern California area, uh, I co-founded a nonprofit called Grid 110, which uh, works with the city of LA and Mayor Eric Garcetti. We focus on underrepresented founders. So you know, I think we're 70% female founders and 60% founders of color. And that's become one of the most rigorous training grounds for early stage entrepreneurs. So if you're in our neck of the woods, definitely check that out. That's grid110.org, grid110.org. And uh, feel free to reach out. Be happy to chat. Wonderful. And we'll make sure and put both of those websites up so that people can access those. Justin, I really want to thank you for being here today. This has been a very interesting conversation, as I knew it would be because I'm always fascinated by the the projects that you work on. And I think you have a lot of value for our audience out here. So I want to thank you again for being here today. I want to thank all of our listeners and hope that you've enjoyed this episode at EdTech Speaks and that you can make use of some of the information that we've given you today. We look forward to having you join us again. And to find out more information or to reach our initial pod site, you can reach us at www.downingedtech.com or at Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google, Acast, Stitcher, or on Apple. Thanks again so much, everybody. And until next time, please keep learning. Thank you for listening to EdTech Speaks with EdTech strategist Cher Downing. To learn more about the services Downing EdTech and its staff can provide you, find us at www.downingedtech.com. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to share it. We'd also like to hear from you regarding any suggestions for topics or guests and the value you received from our show. Check back for new podcasts with featured guests at www.downingedtech.com backslash podcast. Wow. Wow. Wow.